Well, hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us uh, for tonight's Rookie Series webinar session, Intro to Hand Cycling. Um, so we have reserved time at the end of the uh, webinar for a Q&A portion. Um, so during the bulk of this presentation, your microphone will be muted, uh, but we'll open, up, open it up for questions at the end. Um, so I'm just going to jump right in here. Um, so the purpose of the webinar tonight uh, is to provide some general information about Adaptive Sports Ohio, um, who can participate in our adaptive sports programs, and then the different interscholastic and community-based programs we have available. And then we'll also go into more detail um, about the sport of hand cycling, and then talk about uh, participation opportunities and how you can get involved. Um, and then we all will also provide an opportunity to hear from a current athlete and then answer any questions you might have. So my name is Brooke Kieber. Uh, I'm a program manager uh, for our Wayne County programs. And then with me is Brett Followay. He's our director of equipment operations and is also a program manager. And then we're excited to have Steven Zervel as our guest speaker tonight. Um, he's a multi-sport athlete and actively competes in hand cycling races and then does it recreationally as well. So I'll start off by just providing an introduction to our organization. We are a nonprofit that provides a variety of community-based and interscholastic adaptive sports opportunities throughout Ohio. We were founded in 2009 by Lisa Followay, and the idea for the organization was inspired by her son, Casey, who was born with spina bifida. Casey was really active as a kid and loved sports growing up, and he wanted the same chance to participate like his peers. And when Lisa discovered how playing sports immensely benefited Casey, um, she felt that everyone with a physical disability should have that same opportunity to play and gain those benefits. Um, so that's kind of how Adaptive Sports Ohio was born. And our mission is to remove barriers to ensure that individuals with physical disabilities have a chance to play and then utilize sports to elevate ability and empower futures. We are headquartered in Worcester, Ohio, um, but we do have satellite offices in Cleveland and Youngstown and then active programming in six different counties in Ohio, including Wayne, Cuyahoga, Mahoning, Lucas, Stark, and Summit counties. And then through the various interscholastic opportunities and our annual summer dream camp, our reach is really statewide. A common question we get is who are adaptive sports for? Um, who's eligible to participate in adaptive sports? Uh, generally, we say that um, adaptive sports are for individuals with a physical disability that limits their ability to participate in a typical sport. Uh, so some examples of common disability types in a lot of our sports programs include spinal cord injuries, uh, spina bifida, amputees, individuals with visual impairments, cerebral palsy, scoliosis, um, and that's definitely not a comprehensive list, uh, but just kind of gives an overview of some common disability types um, of the athletes in our programs. And then a common misconception about a lot of our sports is that you have to be an everyday wheelchair user to participate. Um, even though a lot of them you know, have wheelchair in the name, you use manual sports chairs to participate, uh, you do not need to be an everyday wheelchair user. And many of our athletes are not everyday wheelchair users. And then really adaptive sports uh, modify typical sports by either adding a piece of equipment uh, or modifying a playing rule. We offer a wide variety of adaptive sports um, and typically break them up into two different categories, our community-based programs, which are open to all ages and disabilities. And then with these programs, um, we have both competitive and recreational opportunities available. And then with any of our programs, um, all of the equipment is provided. Um, we have a large inventory of equipment that we transport to and from practices. And then the sports we offer do vary by location. And then the other category is interscholastic programs, and these are school-based. Um, they provide an opportunity for students with a physical disability to represent and compete for their school teams. Um, so we've started up uh, wheelchair basketball programs in school districts throughout Ohio um, that compete every fall and winter. And then uh, we also assist athletes that wanna get involved on their school's track and field team. Um, so we loan out um, track chairs um, and other equipment and then also provide a training at the beginning of the season and avail are available for support for athletes and coaches throughout the season. Um, here is our Ricky series webinar schedule. We will be offering at least one webinar every month covering a different topic. Um, so it'll always be on the first Wednesday of every month. Uh, so the next webinar we have coming up 
um, after tonight is in July, July 7th, um, and that's wheelchair softball. Uh, so you can be on the lookout for more information about that coming soon. And I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to Brett, um, who's gonna go into more detail about the sport of hand cycling. Okay, what is hand cycling? So hand cycles are similar to bicycles. I mean, other than they have three wheels instead of two. And then you know, the primary difference is you would pedal or power the hand cycle with your arms and hands instead of your feet. So most of the time, whoever is using a hand cycle doesn't have use of their legs. So use their upper body to power it. Uh, they come in several different styles. So you go anywhere from a more of an upright position for somebody who's maybe new to the sport. And then we can get into more the other end into a full competition style. Um, the only equipment needed is the hand cycle and the helmet. So the types, if we start on your left there, the XLT, that's more of an entry level. Recreational, you want to go out and just ride the bike trails with your family, get some exercise. That's a good one for that. Uh, the Force 3 there in the middle gets you down a little lower and flatter. Um, if you want to go a little faster, maybe just mess around a little bit with some you know, competitive, maybe get in a race here or there. That'd be more what you're looking at. And then the force NRG, that's more for elite uh, competitive athletes. So if you're like really into the sport and you're going to be like training often or full time and traveling to actual races, and that's going to be the type of hand cycle you're going to be looking at. And as, as they go from recreational to competitive, they get more expensive. Paracycling. Paracycling is part of the Paralympic program governed by, wow, you might have to help me say this here, um, Stephen. <laughs> oh, you, you just say Union Cyclists International. <laughs> like, okay, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, U.S. Paralympics manages the U.S. Paralympic cycling team, works closely with USA Cycling Community Partners to provide recreational and competitive opportunities for paracyclists in the United States. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then the Paralympic competition does include uh, sprints, uh, individual pursuits, thousand mile, thousand mile, excuse me, meter. That'd be awesome, wouldn't it, there, Stephen? Thousand mile. Oh, man. Thousand <laughs> meter time trial, road races, and road time trials. So um, you can take them on public roads. I mean, they'll be close to traffic, of course, for the, the races. And then you can do a velodrome, which is basically an oval track with with uh, banked turns and then straight version of a, like an outdoor running track. And then athletes can participate in World Cups, World Regional Championships throughout the year. So you can, if you're really serious about the sport, you can go all the way to yeah. competing internationally, or you can just, you can just ride around your neighborhood. That's what you want. And any chance you could jump in here, Stephen? Unless you're not. Yeah, so the the classification, um, there is a pretty large range of classification within paracycling. And um, tonight we're definitely obviously talking more about hand cycles, but um, there are the tricycles, uh, which is more similar to an able-bodied two-wheeled bike. Um, but it just has two wheels in the rear to help athletes balance. Um, that would be more like it's mentioned the T1 through T2 and then C1 through C5 gets into, I'm not as familiar with those classifications because I'm most familiar with the hand cycling. So um, I'll, I'll stick closer to the hand cycling, but basically H1 through H5, what that describes is somebody who is a higher level quad. So somebody with, um, limited to no hand function at all, primarily no hand function, no tricep, um, like only bicep and shoulders would be an H1. H2 is when you start to have some hand function, um, it's pretty limited. Uh, you start to gain tricep um, in that category, but still no core. Um, and then H3, you have a stronger chest, stronger back, um, upper, upper shoulder muscles. Um, H4 is when you start to get into the core uh, an athlete has more core function, full hand function, arm function, and then H5 gets into um, cyclists who are amputees primarily or high functioning spinal cord injuries. Cool. 
All right, so we do have upcoming clinic uh, for Cleveland, Monday, June 28th. Um, we haven't set that time just yet, but I don't know how to pronounce the, you know how to pronounce that there, Brooke? Because I don't. It's the reservation. ACA, you think that is? ACA? All right, ACA. reservation. ACA. That's in Lyndhurst. It's a nice, it's got some, it's a nice winding trail. I mean, nothing too long and flat when you're really going to get some high speeds going, but it's, it's a little bit challenging, some hills and some curves, so it's nice. And then we're looking to get one set Mill Creek Park over in Youngstown. So we'll be putting that out once that is uh, all established. And hand cycles will be provided. So if you're ready to start, uh, you can contact us. Um, get on that registration link and get signed up. You can see we got a couple of our athletes there in the picture. And I believe that's at the trail that we're going to be doing our clinic at. So, yeah, all you have to do after that is just show up. We'll throw a helmet on you and see what which hand cycle fits you best. And we will take off. All right, Brooke. Um, we also just wanted to point out that there are several grant opportunities available if you'd be interested in trying to get your own hand cycle. Um, Athletes Helping Athletes is a great one um, for kids uh, and it's fairly easy uh, to get a free hand cycle for kids through them. Um, so that's a great option. And then you also have Challenge Athletes Foundation, um, Kelly Brush uh, for individuals with um, spinal cord injuries, Travis Roy Foundation um, also for individuals with spinal cord injuries and J Rob Foundation. Um, so if you would like additional information about these, um, they would be uh, great opportunities you know, to apply for grants and try to get funding for your own hand cycle. Um, and we can help you with that process. All right, so we'll move into the guest speaker portion with Steven and then uh, have a Q&A at the end. So, Steven is a, like I said, a multi-sport athlete, uh, competes recreationally and competitively in hand cycling, um, and is also a competitive wheelchair rugby player. He is an engineer for Top End, so he's going to be a great resource um, if you have any questions about the hand cycles themselves. Uh, so Steven, thank you again for joining us tonight um, to discuss your experience with hand cycling. Um, can you just start out by telling us how you first got involved with adaptive sports and then um, specifically with hand cycling? Yeah, so hand cycling was actually the first adaptive sport that I had any experience with. And um, it came about through a mentor of mine um, talking about a local marathon, the Akron Marathon. Um, so in quick summary, I got out of um, inpatient rehab in the early spring of 2009. And then he, uh, my mentor was going to start training for the Akron Marathon. He brought up to me that uh, there was a wheelchair division and basically said, hey, you should get a hand cycle and go do this with me. So my family and friends um, raised some money and I was able to purchase a hand cycle. It's actually the, the XLT model um, that Brett spoke of toward the beginning. And um, yeah, that was, that was the first experience it took me a shameful amount of time, but I still completed the marathon. So <laughs> we'll end it with that. But yeah, that was my, <laughs> my first experience with adaptive sports um, and then specifically hand cycling. Um, so what is it about hand cycling that you enjoy the most that made you want to get um, involved more competitively? So for me, I, before my injury, I was always really into bikes. Um, I did a lot of BMX, so more like freestyle stuff. Um, but still just always attracted to bikes and being able to get out of my wheelchair and go for a ride around the town that I lived in, um, go to the skate park, any of that. So after I started hand cycling, it, uh, continued to be sort of that escape for me initially where I could just get on the bike and go ride. Um, and then I started uh, meeting people through work who rode and just got more involved. I was able to attend a couple of races and um, found it really challenging. So um, like you had mentioned, I, I do wheelchair rugby as well, but hand cycling was just a different challenge. You, there was a lot more detail around it. And um, it, it was a sport that you couldn't just show up on a weekend and compete at a race and do well. Um, you didn't have other people around you to back you up if you were having an off day. So I liked those aspects of it because it required a lot of um, discipline. Um, 
and now, yeah, it's still that escape. So I go on Saturday rides with guys and we'll go 10 miles an hour or sometimes, you know, 18, somewhere around there, um, which is super difficult for me. So I'm just hanging on during those rides, but uh, it's still great. There's a community around and then the general health obviously is a big plus. And then being a multi-sport athlete, what do you think the benefits are of playing multiple sports um, as opposed to just playing or maybe just doing hand cycling? So I, I'd say that there's different commitment levels to sport depending on what your end goal is. Um, so if, if there is a goal of going to the highest level, then there's certainly a requirement to get very specific with the discipline of the sport that you're most interested in. Um, but for me right now, I'm not quite at that level where I'm looking to, yeah, to go to the Paralympics um, this year or next, but it, it enables me to still have a good community, be around different people. Um, and then just the experiences themselves are totally different. Um, going, to, going to a tournament for rugby is much different than going to a weekend away for hand cycling. Um, so the variety and experience and people, I'd say. Um, how has your involvement in adaptive sports impacted your overall well-being? Um, aside from faith and family, it's probably faith, family, and friends. It's it's right behind those three things. Um, I just, I think it brings a huge sense of normalcy. Um, it gives you something to work towards. It gives you gives you an escape, um, keeps you healthy, healthy, and um, th there's always something that can be learned, be it through the sport or the people that you're around. Um, so for me, I think getting involved in sport, I was three year, two or three years after um, my injury that I got involved with wheelchair rugby. And that's when my life really started to change where I found independence by talking with other guys who had uh, similar situations. Um, they were able to give me different tips about how to do things. And then um, I was able to see guys with good relationships and families. So it kind of gives you a foresight to what your life could be. And then also gives you some uh, constructive feedback from other people uh, to become as independent as functionally possible. So yeah, it's huge. Um, we alluded to this a little bit in the presentation, uh, but can you talk about what makes hand cycling such an inclusive sport and great for multiple disability types? Yeah, I think a lot of that has to do with what um, Brett was talking about with the different models that are out there for people to try. And it, the, not just hand cycling, but adaptive cycling or paracycling goes even further beyond um, hand cycles alone. So you can, I mean, there's people who are blind who ride bikes. There's people who are missing just one leg or an arm or, you know, and, and, and. So there, there's just such a variety of designs available for people with varying disability types. Um, and you don't have to go out and be super competitive. It's something that you can do with other uh, peers and friends and family. Um, you can go out to a local trail like you guys are looking to do um, and ride with friends and family or go all the way up to worlds where you're competing at the highest level with able-bodied cyclists. So it's super inclusive, not only for people of varying disabilities, but once you're either at a recreational level or a high competition level, you're intertwined with able-bodied cyclists at a, at a similar level. So. so for those who may be starting uh, we're trying out hand cycling for the first time, these beginners trying it. Um, mm -hmm. What would you say would be a good distance um, to start out with for them? So it's easy to think in terms of distance and speed, but because there's so many varying environments and roads and trails that you can ride on, be it hilly or flat, I tend to um, guide people towards a time. So if you can ride, like if you're just getting out there and you're able to ride for a half hour, I think that's great. That's, that's awesome. And then you can work from there. So it's not as much about how far um, initially, but just how long you're able to ride the hand cycle. And then if you're, if you are looking to get into any type of racing, I think 
there still are some marathons that allow hand cycles and that's a great first um I think that's a great first event for people who are new and just looking to get involved in longer distance sports, um, particularly with a hand cycle. Um, those are good environments because there's plenty of people around, super safe, and it's still a good challenge. So a hand cycle is a pretty large and heavy piece of equipment. Um, how do you transport your hand cycle? Um, do you need a certain type of vehicle or size of vehicle? Um, so I have a Volkswagen wagon. Uh, it's just like a hatchback, but extended. And I'm able to fit my hand cycle in there with just taking off the rear wheels. So that makes it really convenient. Um, there are, you know, typically a hatchback or larger of a vehicle is ideal. Um, but there are different bike racks and things like that that you can purchase for hand cycles. Um, it's not as practical, I would say but it is possible to have a sedan, get a hitch installed and then get a bike rack. Um, but yeah, ideally something like a hatchback or larger it does pretty well. Okay. Um, and then if someone wasn't sure about trying hand cycling, um, what would you say to them to convince them to try it? Um, say first you have to want to try it. You want it. So, yeah, sports are supposed to be fun. So if you haven't experienced it and you're, you don't have a good reason to not just try it for the experience, I would say, give it a go. Just try, try as many sports as you can. <laughs> Any opportunities that come your way, go for it and try it. Um, and then hand cycling in particular, I think just has so many benefits. As we were talking, you're able to do that sport with friends and family who may not be disabled. You're able to join community of people who are that hand cycle. Um, and it, it really is great for your health. It's great for your, your cardio and just being out on the trails. It, it's super peaceful. Um, and then I think for a lot of people, it's a great opportunity, opportunity to get out of their chair or uh, gain another dynamic of freedom. Like even if you're amputee or whatever else, it, it's just another, another dynamic um, to experience. All right. That is all I have. So I now's a good time to open it up to the audience for questions. Um, so if you have a question, you can either post it in the chat or in the Q&A. Um, if you wanna ask a question live, there's a raise hand function um, and we can allow you to talk live on that way. So let's see, Brian, uh, looks like you have your hand raised. Do you have a question? You might be muted. Maybe he doesn't have a question. I just wanted to tell I am, I don't have a question. I'm just enjoying listening. So I'll just Brian. keep stay on. Hi, Brian. How you doing? Good. We miss you coming out. You doing all right? Yeah. All right, good. Thanks for coming, Brian. Okay. All right, anyone else have a question? All right, Jeanette, you have a question for us? Yeah, my son <clears throat> has cerebral palsy and does have some use of his legs and has used um, a tricycle for a while for a bike and then he also had a uh, I don't know what to call it but it was a low that kind of similar to uh, I don't know what it was called I'm sorry uh, that probably, doesn't a, probably That's recumbent, a recumbent right he's kind of sitting more yeah. in a laid back position a little bit but he really struggled to use it and um I I'm excited to hear that you actually have a a clinic in Cleveland so maybe I could get him to that and um, get him to try the hand cycle. We've never done the hand cycle. I always thought it was better for him to use his legs because he could, but he really struggled when we switched from the tricycle to the more, I'm going to call it recumbent bike. Um, 
but I always, I always thought it was so good for him to use his legs if he could. So that's why I've struggled with letting him do the um, hand cycle. Do you have thoughts on that or? Um, yeah, I think, I think so much of it depends on, a lot of it goes back to, you know, if w whatever piece of equipment um, he uses, it, it needs to be something that's practical and enjoyable or it won't be used in, in many cases. Um, so if, yeah, I think it, it ends up coming down to what's the most functional piece of equipment that is also enjoyable. Um, and if that ends up being something that's powered uh, by his arms, then great. Um, but yeah, as far as the type of equipment you're talking about, I'm not as familiar with it. Um, but I, I do think a great starting point is definitely going out to the clinic. And then um, once Brett has a better idea or whomever has a better idea of um, the needs, then I think that's a great starting point. You can start to look at certain equipment that's going to be most helpful. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. And if there are no more questions, um, I think we can go ahead and close this out. Um, Stephen, thank you again. You're welcome. Uh, super helpful. And uh, we have our contacts listed there on the screen. If you have any additional questions um, or want to get involved in one of our upcoming clinics, you can e either I'm at uh, either email myself or Brett um, or uh, call our office. Um, we're also on social media, um, so you can give us a follow on those platforms. And thank, again, thank you all for joining us um, and have a great night. Awesome. Thank you, guys.